Laughing Out Loud, America's Funniest Comedians. Featuring classic comedy performances by Drew Carey, Dennis Wolfberg, Marty Putz, Tom Arnold, Laura Keitlinger, John Mulrooney, and Bobby Collins. Just got in from Miami. Anybody know it? <laughs> yeah, let me make you feel at home. How are you, man? <laughs> oh, my God. These people are farting dust down there, I tell you. <laughs> and the humidity, you get off the plane, you know it's going to be a bad hair day, right? You, you get off, and my hair... I look like Link from Mod Squad. <laughs> and it's all Cuban, and they're great people. It's all Cuban, and 95%. Thank God I took, like, Spanish one for, like, five years, you know? <laughs> Hola, Isabel. Como estas? Estoy bien, gracias. E2? <laughs> Me llamo Roberto. <laughs> Cuban guys see me now with like an afro. I bought a dashiki and I was selling some incense by now. And they came over to me. They're like, "What is it? What is it? What is Hola, Isabel. Como esta? You ever see a Cuban stutter? What is it? So I shot him. <laughs> ah. And every commercial down there is for something called Depends. You know what it is? I didn't know what it is. What is it? Diapers for the adults. Hey, I'd wear these. Come on, you ever go to a movie in the middle of the movie you gotta go? Now you lean over. You're at the grocery store, the lay the cashier's over there, sir, 41.95. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm having an accident. Give me one of those magazines. Oh, go ahead. You can go in front of me. They took me to a nude beach. They took me to a nude beach. I wear like trunks, right? I wear trunks, short trunks, nice. Not the Cuban guys, oh no, they're only this big and they wear like Speedos. And they got like kielbasa in the front there. And they're standing there, cuando se canta el Goya. Now I'm inadequate, I'm like, I gotta be B2, I gotta be B2. I go to the beach, and the women are all nude. They're all topless, and, and I kind of like that, you know? And two of them recognize me. They come over to me, and I tell you, I froze, you know? And they're coming over, they're talking to me. In my head, I was like, touch my pee-pee, touch my pee-pee. <laughs> but I couldn't say that, so I froze. I'm like, I'm... Now, they're looking at each other. Is this guy like a fool? No! I became like a point of reference on the beach. People, people were like, where's the ladies' room? Make a right at a guy that looks like a rhododendron. No! So, it's good to be here. Hey, what, what happened to Ted Kennedy's head? This guy looks like Mr. Potato Head now. Oh my God! see him on TV? He looks like a keg of beer. <laughs> Even the other senators were going over to his head. Hey, opening up his head. Beer here. You want some beer? Beer here. And you know he's looking at Anita Hill going, look at the bazoolies on her. Somebody's got to say it, right? <laughs> Come on, 
Son, did you see him? Even little, he's gonna be in the Thanksgiving Day Parade in New York. Hey, Ma, what, what float is that? Oh, that's the new state Kennedy uh, from Massachusetts, the senator. He's like, his head just kept getting bigger and bigger. Be here, be here. Come on, you know this guy Clarence Thomas, come on. I come from New York. You can look in someone's eyes and you know who's lying. This guy, yeah. Anita, come on in the office, come on in, yeah. Close the door, yeah, come on in. Hey, Anita. Anita. Say hello to Long Dong Silva. Come on. want to come from Utah, because I want Orrin Hatch representing me. <laughs> hey, Orrin, glazed donut or a brown muffin? <gasps> I don't know. <laughs> ah. I've been away, traveling, my wife, like, all, all time, last week. Bob, the baby's got a cold, new baby. Baby's got a cold. Okay, I'm coming home. I walk in the door, I got my bags, the baby's right standing right there. She blows a bubble out of a nostril. <laughs> my wife runs over with something that looks like a turkey base. They go, <laughs> sucked her brains out, her head caved in. I call 911, we're getting a divorce. I get back out here. <laughs> I get back out here. Bobby, 10K race. Run a 10K with us. Come on, Bob. I, I'm from New York. We rush. We don't run. <laughs> Come on, 10K, 10K. What is that? Kilos? Come on. How many blocks is that? I show up. I got my gym shorts on, T-shirt, black socks. I'm a New Yorker, right? <laughs> I show up, I'm waiting there. How hard can 6.2 miles be for a New Yorker? I got my gym sneakers on, come on. First two miles, I'm fooling around. I'm running backwards, I'm like. <laughs> After the second mile, I, I couldn't form vowels. <laughs> and people talk to you when they run. Hey, Bob, how you doing? Oh, I'm not doing so good. <laughs> At one point, a bubble came out of my mouth. And my face was so tired, it started to lift my face up. And, and people are going, look, he's the comic. He's always fooling around. I, I never had a bubble come out of my mouth. I always thought your lungs were somewhere in here. Oh, they're not. They're not. They're right here. They're right here. The little man with a knife, and he kept stabbing me. Kept stabbing me. Thank God the people I was running with were oblivious to the fact that I was having respiratory problems. Or as we say in New York, a uh, stroke. What's a stroke? That's when half your body chooses up sides to see which half's going to die first. I look good from the left. If you saw me from the left, 10K, Carl Lewis, 10K. From the right, I don't like that. Cars were going by. They thought I was waving at them. I was like, no. And then the bubble came out. I really My name's Bobby Collins. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Next up, John Mulrooney. Good evening and welcome tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I just got off a cruise and I'm still sobering up. I'm sure you all know what that's all about. A cruise is one big floating excuse to get drunk. Except the one advantage I found to being on a cruise is on a boat, right? The boat moves, right? But since the drunks stagger when they walk, they walk straight on a cruise. You know what I'm talking about? Sober people are bouncing off the walls. Drunks like, get out of the way, you sober idiot. You're screwing up the whole party. Have a cocktail and fall in line, will you? You know, if you go on a cruise between, if you go first class with the gambling and all that other nonsense, you can spend a lot of money. So I don't understand why they get to make the rules on a cruise. Like dinner, for instance, you're supposed to get dressed up. It's a big crock, right? You know? I show up to dinner the first night. I didn't know. This is the first night on the ship. You know? And I'm wearing uh, vacation attire. Sandals, you know. One of them's broken, so I'm walking like this, trying to keep it on. Shorts, t-shirt, you know, goofy umbrella drink. And there's a maitre d' at the dining room door, standing there. You know these snotty, arrogant guys? 
He's got that attitude like he can smell a dirty diaper, but he can't find it. <laughs> Gives him that long one, so he goes, pardon me, sir. You're not properly attired for dinner this evening. What? <laughs> Listen, tough guy, unless you want trouble, get out of the way. All right, now I start swinging. <laughs> this is a big act, right? You got to get dressed up. Come on, that's a lot of. It's like I don't understand like what pepper is in a restaurant. Someone please tell me what that's all about. Why does pepper get such special treatment? Right? Your salad comes out and some special pepper ninja <laughs> appears from nowhere with like a missing coffee table leg. <laughs> No, but I am missing a rung in my banister. <laughs> the hell is this? Suddenly I'm a pepper connoisseur. I can tell the difference between what's already on the table and what you're trying to screw out of this wooden leg. It's a big act. They tell you, well, that's fresh ground pepper right there. That pepper right there has been freshly ground brand new for you right here at your table. <laughs> Okay, thank you, I appreciate the effort. But what about the other condiments? You know, how come they don't get the same treatment? Where's a guy with a belt sander and a big block of salt? <laughs> Fresh salt, beep! <laughs> or a guy with a tomato and a mallet. <laughs> Ketchup on your fries? <laughs> Little Mark? Cream in your coffee, lady? <laughs> Come on, hold that cup up, get it. Hey. All right, come on, Elsie, back in the kitchen now, you big old cow. Look at that cow, she sure gets excited around people, doesn't she? <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that whole wine tasting routine either, you know, that's another big act. I don't know about you guys, but I don't drink wine in a restaurant because it tastes good. I just want to get a little buzz with dinner. That's all. The same maitre d' comes out with the bottle wrapped in a towel, like he just gave birth to it. Would you like to see the label? Why, does it have a warning on it? Unless you see a skull and crossbones I'm unaware of. Crack it open and fill up the glasses, Captain. And then they open it up. Would you like to smell the cork? Why, where'd you have it? You smell it. Maybe it was in that dirty diaper you were looking for. Right? I just came back from visiting the folks in New York. It's always a pleasure for my folks when I come home. Reminds of me when I was a child. We played some nasty tricks on my folks. The worst had to be when I was, when I was 13 years old. Um, my brother was a year older than I am, uh, so it makes him. He was 14. We were sitting at the kitchen table, doing our homework or something, and my mom was cooking by the kitchen uh, stove, and she goes, my sister Mary, who was about a year old at the time, was upstairs, and she had just awakened from a nap, and my mother heard her crying. So she goes, um, you know, I think I hear you, your sister crying. She goes, run upstairs and get her. Okay. Me and my brother run upstairs, we get her. And I says to my brother, hey, Billy, let's play a joke on mommy. It involves the baby. <laughs> and my brother, Dah! Okay, boss, if you say so. <laughs> so we take this outfit off that my sister is sleeping on, sleeping in. Put it on my other sister's doll and then stand at the head of the stairs and argue about who's gonna carry the baby down. Just loud enough so my mother can hear. All right? Billy, give me the baby. I'll take the, give me the baby. I'll carry her down. You let go of her head. You let go of her feet. 
My mother comes sprinting from the kitchen in a house coat with a spatula. Mother of God! Don't fight with the baby at the top of the stairs! And as she rounds the clubhouse turn, my brother and I whip the doll down the stairs. It spins end over end. The head splits off. The torso keeps going. And my mother goes, oh. Have a good night, everybody. And thank you. Thank you, John. And now, here's Laura Keitlinger. All right. Thank you. I'll go. Uh, thanks. I actually, I'm really, I'm glad to be here. I just got back from Virginia. There's the joke. No, I, uh, I was, I was doing stand-up at a club in Virginia, and while I was at the hotel, uh, there was a fire, and this guy came and knocked on the door, and he said, "Get out! You've got two minutes. Everybody, get out! Two minutes. There's a fire." And I just stood there and I thought, you know, what do you take in two minutes? You know, what's important? How do you decide? So uh, I took the towels and the complimentary soaps. <laughs> so. Anyway, I, you know, I like this job. Not just because of the hotel fires, but for so many reasons. Uh, no, I do really like it. I think it's important to like your job because, you know, it's just, I, you know, I, I, I think to myself, what would be the very worst job? What would be the toughest? And I think that it would have to be a delivery person. You know, because when you think, you know, that's dangerous because you don't know what's going to open the door when you go to someone's house, right? And you got to think to yourself, what the hell is wrong with these people that they can't leave to even feed themselves, <laughs> you know? So uh, whenever I have food ordered in, I try to decide what is the worst way to come to the door. And uh, I've decided that it's tied to a chair. <laughs> You know, I just, uh, they open the door, I've got the money in my mouth, and I say, well, I guess my boyfriend's in one of his moods again. <laughs> he loves me, it's just, oh my God, he's got a knife, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, well, so what, what is the moral of the story? You've got to be happy with your life, you've got to be happy with what you do, because if you're not, then you've got to go on a talk show and tell everybody about it, right? <laughs> And uh, I saw one of the most unbelievable themes on one of these shows that I've seen so far. It was ridiculous. Three people came out and they talked about their failed attempts at suicide. And then they gave a 1-800 number that you could call. And actually, I was so moved that I called and I voted for the first guy. Because, uh, you know. I figure this time next year, uh-huh. Okay. I don't know. I just see. I just. I just feel like with all these talk shows, it's just all. It's just too much. You know. Everybody has to admit something. Life is just a gigantic AA meeting. You know. It's just everything. I actually. I was standing in a deli, in the middle of the afternoon, and there was a woman in front of me, and she ordered a decaf coffee, and the guy behind the counter says decaf, and she took that question to just spill. She said, Oh yes, <laughs> I can't have caffeine. <laughs> Caffeine has a very bad effect on my bowels, and you know, I, uh, I haven't been touched by another human being since 1981. And my, my first unnatural reaction to that was, oh man, now I've got to top that? You know, uh, so I go up and I say, listen, all right, I'll have a coffee regular, because it has a good effect on my bowels. I'm finally able to say that, and you know what? I have been touched, but I've forgotten how to feel. <laughs> That's two sugars, and I think she needs a hug, okay? <laughs> She's crazy. I see, I won't do it. I won't get into the whole self-analysis thing. I just won't, because I don't have to. My boyfriend will do it for me. Uh, you know, actually, I, I'm probably a classic case, really. I'm early for everything. I'm about 45 minutes early for everything. And uh, I went with my boyfriend to a show before the doors were opened, and he, that was it. He just said, you know what, Laura? You know why you're always early? It's because you're afraid you're going to miss something. That means you've got low self-esteem and no concept of your own self-worth. And I said, so what, you don't want to pee on me now? <laughs> turning into. Now, I, uh, I live alone. 
Because really, where could I go after I said that? Uh, <laughs> no, I, um, I do live alone, and I enjoy it, except now I have this neighbor who I call my I'm sorry neighbor, because she says I'm sorry for everything, but she doesn't mean it. And she hears something every night, and she knocks on the door every night, and she's like, hi, hi, I'm sorry. Could you turn your TV down? Yeah, it's a little loud. I, oh, <laughs> oh I'm sorry. It's just, oh, oh, yeah. Listen, I, oh, I know I'm bothering you. I, oh, listen, I, oh. Uh, could you, uh, could you shut off all your appliances, too? I'm sorry, I, oh. I'm hearing something. Your electricity is, oh, very loud. I'm sorry, I, oh, I'm sorry. Listen, I, 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 oh, I, I, look, I, I, oh, I, see, I, oh. Listen, you're, you're walking in your place, too, right? Yeah, oh. Oh, right, left, right, left. <laughs> Listen, uh, is, that, uh, is that something you have to do? I, I was wondering, could you cut your feet off? I'm sorry. I, oh. <laughs> so anyway. And uh, actually, I had one neighbor who I just loved. And uh, she was an elderly woman, about 85. And of all things, I found myself in a politeness contest with her. Like we were trying to out-nice each other, which I thought was a great New York thing to happen. Like, I turned my stereo down to be nice. So then she turned her radio down, and then I stopped talking on the phone late at night, so she unplugged her phone. And then I stopped waking up to my alarm, so she died in her sleep. And I just, uh, yeah, you know, that, um, that touched me, you know, that touched me. That, uh, uh, I think it's women helping other women. No, no, no. Uh, no actually, um, my grandmother is very hip. I have to go right into that, actually. Uh, uh, because I'm getting a light to get off. No, uh, no I, uh, my grandmother's very hip, and uh, she is. She just told me recently that she's pro-choice, and I. She says it's because she's pro-woman, but I, I, I think it's because she just can't see another generation borrowing money from her. That's uh, what my take is. No, but she's great. She's very religious, you know, and uh, she actually she tries to get me on the bandwagon with it. And I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. Like, I don't know if, if you remember this, but this is all about religious sightings and stuff. About eight months ago, a man in Spain had a religious experience where he actually saw the hand of the statue of the Jesus bleeding. And then two months after that, a girl in Italy saw the Virgin Mary crying. Yeah, and I'm proud to tell you that I've finally had a religious experience myself. I was at the Bob's Big Boy in Paramus, New Jersey. <laughs> And I actually saw liquid rust coming out of the butt of the big boy icon. And, uh, yeah. You know, yeah, it's something, isn't it? When it happens to you, it's like, well, all right. <laughs> something out there. But I'm very I'm fascinated with religion of all kinds and all this stuff. And uh, before I left New York, there was an atheist parade. I don't think it had anything to do with me. You know, I don't think they said, Laura's gone, what's there to believe in? No, I think they were going to have it anyway. Uh, but they had, a, uh, they had an atheist parade. And to me, that is just hilarious, you know? An atheist parade. I mean, because I didn't know you could march for something you don't believe in. I just find it possible. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Laura. And here he comes, Tom Arnold. Thank you. Actually, I have to tell you, this is my first time in Boston, but I, I'm actually from Toronto. But I'm living in California now, and since I've been out there, I found some really cool things. Check this out, I just found it. It's the coolest. It's the new California party hat. Yeah, drinks, no problem. <laughs> and since I've been living in California, though, I've been attending a lot of old movie revival theaters. So right now, I'd like to do my impression of my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie. It's the coolest. Drum roll, right here, sir. Give me a drum roll. What the hell was that, pal? I said a drum roll, man. Get it going. Jesus. What? I missed? No problem. But it's back to my favorite Alfred Hitchcock movie. It's the coolest. <laughs> But this is the best of Christmas time, though, when the malls are really crowded. I love to come running out of pet shops with this on. <laughs> Better yet, we stuck this on my grandmother's face last week. She's 88 years old. She has 10 cats. <laughs> 
but now she's dead. <laughs> But growing up, my mom used to bug us a lot, so I used to do a few things to get even with her. This is one of my favorites. This is so cool. Whenever she was ironing, I used to sneak up behind her, and when she wasn't looking, I'd grab the iron and do this. <laughs> I guess you never did that, okay. All right, snack time. Anyone hungry? All right, anyone breathing? Whatever you do, when you get a marshmallow, don't eat it. Hang on to it, right here, sir. Good grab, young lady there. Ooh, nice snatch. All right, sir. Back there, sir. All right, this will be so cool. Ma'am, this is so cool. Look straight ahead. Don't move. Relax. Look straight ahead. Don't move. Relax. I'm innocent. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Don't move. This will be a blast. Don't move. Don't move. Doesn't matter. We'll go for the head. Put it back up like a good friend. All right. Just trust me. Just trust me. All right. Don't move. Don't move. Oh, eye protection. Good thinking. Hang on. All right. Good thinking. I was protecting my eyes, sir. <laughs> All right, hold still, hold still. Don't move, close your eyes. Ho! Ho! All right. All right, All right. hang on to it, hang on to it. Everyone who has a marshmallow, hold it up high. Hold it up high, hold it up. Oh, geez, take two, big guy. Hold it up, gang, because right now, it's time for a game of human baseball! Wait a minute, dipstick, wait! I'll kill you all. By the way, gang, before you throw it, none of this with it, okay? All right, we're going for a grab. Who's got one? Who's got one? All right, the young lady here. On three, in the mouth. <laughs> Are you ready? One, two, three. Yeah! Oh, now we're going for a <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that, honest. <laughs> now, back there. Why are you laughing, man? You're wearing glasses. <laughs> All right, a little bit faster. Right here, buddy, stand up, man. I want you to whip it really fast. You with me? Shut up, lady. All right, really fast. Don't be a wimp suck. You with me? Really fast. All right, here we go. On three, gun it. One. Wait, on three. Wait, look. Mommy. Yeah, all the guys are laughing and all the women are going, oh. All right, here we go, pal. On three, gun it. Shut up, pal. Here we go, are you ready? Really fast. One, two, three. Do you need a bigger target, pal? All right, right here, bub, right here. Let's gun it, man. Really wind up and let it rip. Tonight, on three. You wuss, is that it? Gun it! Gun it! <laughs> All right, right there. All right, let's go, buddy. Last chance. Last chance, really. You can move up. Move up a step. Come on, we got to get it. Really fast. That's it. Don't worry about your shirt. Come on over. All right. Really fast. Really. Move really fast. Let's go. Oh. 
schmuck, you meant that. Let's see how you like it. You know what, though? I've been going to movies a lot, and I'm finding out that people really annoy me at movies, so I've come up with a few things I like to take to get even with people. This is one of my favorites. This is so cool, ladies. <laughs> This I love to take to horror movies and I love to sneak up and sit in front of about five or six people and right at that scary part in the movie when they're sitting there going, oh, 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 wrong movie, sorry. <laughs> right at that scary part, I like to do this, sneak up and do this. If all your hair was frightened? Ah! <laughs> oh, this is really cool. And then he goes, oh, wait, you gotta turn this over. <laughs> sure. How many times do you lose your best friends in crowded malls? That's when you need this the new portable chiropractic machine. Check her out. <laughs> Start her. Simply close her up and turn her on. Ah! Uh. <laughs> and you always get that one person stuffing their face full of food. That's when I buy myself a jumbo box of popcorn and I just sit there and I stare at them and I eat it really slowly. <laughs> I don't say a word and I watch. And then right at that precise moment, I like to go, hey, pig face, turn around. This is what you look like from behind. <laughs> Listen, my name's Marty Potts. Thanks very much, Dan. Let's see Thank you, Marty. Next on stage, Dennis Wolfberg. Thank you, thank you. Well, we do have had a girl. My wife wanted to call her Sue, uh, which is a lovely name, but which for Jews is generally a verb. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you are familiar with part of our culture. Not that I'm a particularly religious Jew. I'm what they call a reform uh, Jew, and reform Jews are the liberal uh, Jews in the Jewish spectrum, and we were very liberal. Our rabbi was a part-time pork distributor, to give you an idea. <laughs> Most congregations are called Beth Shalom or Mount Sinai, and we were called Jews or us. <laughs> and it's hard to take a rabbi seriously when his skullcap has a propeller attached uh, to it. And I'll tell you, my wife uh, is only half uh, Jewish, and, uh, and, and my parents are half... <laughs> Perhaps you could relate to this dynamic. Uh, well, because of my wife's background, she would like our son Daniel uh, to have some exposure to all the holidays, Christmas, uh, as well as Hanukkah, for example. Uh, not that everyone is familiar with Hanukkah. <laughs> well, when I was in Mobile, Alabama this past December, where, where men are men and Jews are bait, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> somebody actually said to me, Happy Chaka Khan. Can you believe this? <laughs> Happy. Shaka Khan, I said a delightful Ozzy and Harriet to you, Billy Bob. <laughs> Happy Shaka Khan. Uh. So we have a little boy named Daniel. I enjoy being a father. Uh, it's uh, obviously a completely new role for me. I mean, uh, my wife and I haven't even been married all that long. We had Daniel after we were married about a year. Uh, we decided to have uh, a baby because my wife was pregnant. <laughs> and we've always been practical in our approach to problem solving. We, we felt ready. We had, we had lived together for several years. We lived in sin, as the Bible says. The Bible says premarital sex is a sin, and my wife says the way I did it, it was a crime. <laughs> <laughs> I was single uh, for very long. I was single till I was uh, 39 years old. That's a long time, and uh, I know you're asking how such a spectacular hunk of granite such as myself could, <laughs> could have escaped marital ensnarement for so many years, but... Uh, 
I was not, in fact, remarkably successful with women, and I know that that's hard to believe by looking at me, but uh, uh, go with me on this one, okay? Just stretch your collective imagination, if you would. Some men have it, whatever it is. It's indefinable. It's like a chemical reaction that will excite women by their mere presence, and I had the antidote to whatever this reaction was, and, and I would induce restraint in women. I don't know that I'd want to be single now because of the diseases which have become so frightening. Well, because of these diseases, casual sex has, to a very large extent, uh, uh, disappeared. And so now, with respect to my bachelorhood, I look back on myself as not having been unsuccessful, but ahead of my time. <laughs> I was a virtual pioneer in the world of abstinence. Uh, I didn't practice abstinence. I perfected it, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a little boy. Uh, I was single for so many years. And of course, I'm a little older now. And uh, you, you come face to face with your own mortality. I had uh, a physical a little while back uh, uh, in conjunction with aging, during which my doctor suggested I elevate the fiber content in my diet. And specifically, he suggested I begin eating this new cereal called Fiber One. Now, I don't know if any of you are familiar with this rather powerful <laughs> piece of breakfast fare of the Grim Reaper of Morning Chow, this nuclear laxative in a box, ladies and gentlemen, but this stuff is unbelievable fiber rich. It has six times more fiber than grape nuts and three times more fiber than raw twine. To give you an idea, this stuff is unbelievable. It, it is one thing to be regular, it is another to be unstoppable. It's not as though I have nothing to do with my day. There, there should be a Surgeon General's warning on the box, don't eat unless retired. There's no way to remain a productive citizen of society. And there should be a picture of Tony the Tiger squatting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. And next up, Jenny Joe. See, just because you get a woman comic, you guys, you know, used to... See, you're much... I don't know. I, I talk about men. What? Oh, now you're explaining it to him. Come on, you guys. It's so nice. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Jenny. And now, here... Thank you very much. <laughs> 